I wish to thank the Vermont Department of Libraries for its sponsorship uh, of these programs throughout the state, as well as the law firm Paul Frank and Collins for sponsoring this evening's talk. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Monsieur Farang, author and former diplomat who was born in Iran and served as Iran's first ambassador to the United Nations until resigning in protest when the Khomeini re regime refused to accept the UN Commission of Inquiry's recommendation to release the American hostages in Tehran. Early in the Iran-Iraq War, he served as an envoy in negotiations with international peace missions. Currently, he is on the advisory board of Middle East Watch, a branch of Human Rights Watch. He is the author of U.S. Imperialism from the Spanish-American War to the Iranian Revolution and with William Dorman, the U.S. Press and Iran, Foreign Policy and the Journalism of Deference. He is also a frequent contributor to scholarly journals and the national news media. He has taught at Bennington College since 1983, where he is the Catherine Osgood Foster Chair for Distinguished Teaching. Please join me in welcoming our distinguished guest speaker. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Given the audience, it shouldn't be too difficult for us to think about going to a lecture without PowerPoint. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm really here as a Vermonter, or the introduction decided. You know, we have lived here for 30 years and we love Vermont, and I identify with Vermont more than any other place I have ever lived. So that's, I should say that. The second, I've been on the uh, the lecture list of the Vermont Humanities Council lectures over the past 20 some years and every year on various issues relating to the Middle East. I've been, my wife and I are traveling all over the Vermont, but let me say that the topic is not really an academic abstraction to me. I would have been interested in uh, Middle Eastern politics, American foreign policy, since I was 15 as a high school student. And the, the convulsive nature of the region, the historical changes that they have been going through, I've constantly changed my mind, re-examining the question and trying to, <laughs> to learn if there are patterns and regularities in social sciences, then we teach social sciences, we operate on the assumption that um, there is sense to be made if in human affairs, mm -hmm. from interpersonal to international and anything in between. And that means we claim that there are patterns, regularities, reoccurrences, causalities, correlations, in what human animals do, as distinguished from human events being random, idiosyncratic, and unique. You know, probably we make enough, we make enough sense to uh, justify our paychecks, uh, but even the sense we make is subject to constant change and modification because of the nature of the world we live in, and depending on also where we study. So. In initially, I was coming here, I was asked to give a lecture on the nuclear dispute of Iran and the confrontation between the United States and Iran. And at the time, this was about six months ago or so, and nothing was happening. And I said, listen, this, there isn't really much to say about <laughs> continuation <laughs> of this conflict, so I changed the topic to uh, the struggle for a democracy in the Arab world and the, the impediments to uh, pluralism. Uh, about a month ago, things changed and there was this negotiation between Iran and the United States and they reached you know, an agreement and I thought I should really change my 
topic, <laughs> that maybe it's more you know, relevant. Then after talking to people at Vermont Council of Humanities, I said, no, I will go ahead and do the topic I had suggested. And then at the end of the discussion, if you wish to raise questions about the Iran situation, I will be happy to share my confusion with you. <laughs> <laughs> so let me begin by uh, saying that uh, uh, <clears throat> since the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, there has been a kind of a wave of democratization you know, throughout you know, the world. Uh, in Latin America, even in some African countries, in Asia, East Asia. But when, when it comes to the Middle East, even though, as I will discuss it, that uh, the so-called Arab Spring gave us some hope that the idea of democracy is finally taking root in this region of the world. And then the Arab Spring turned into an Arab winter without <laughs> with, with, within a, a year or two. And then scholars and journalists who have lived in the region, who have studied the region historically and politically, they say, why? Why is it that in this particular region of the world, advancement of democracy is so far behind the rest of the world? And there seems to be so much fragmentation and division and violence in the politics and social relations of the region. And they uh, focus on a variety of reasons. The colonial history that many of the states in the, I don't have the map to show you here, many of the states are really new. A country like Saudi Arabia, it was created in 1932. A country like Iraq didn't even exist before World War I. A country like Lebanon or Syria. These are all new states that in the post-World War I period, France and Great Britain that inherited the territories of the Ottoman Empire, they divided the region between them. And in creating national units, they really paid very little attention to the ethnic and religious fragmentation and plurality of the region. So you go to Iraq and you go to Syria, you go to uh, Lebanon, uh, you go to Yemen, all these you know, countries that were really the creation of the negotiation between Great Britain and uh, France, they were ruled by fundamentally dictators, the dominant elites who cooperated with colonial powers. They put emphasis, on, and of course, as we hear virtually on everyday news, they also say ethnic and religious fragmentation and diversity and the politics of identity makes it very difficult for people to identify with the nation that they vote for religious identity, ethnic identity, tribal identity, clannish identity, but the idea of nation, even though a country like Iran, it's over 3,000 years old, a country like Egypt, in these states, we expect to see a deep sense of national identity, and yet even these countries, with respect to democratic consensus, seem to be behind time and expectation. And therefore, tribalism, lack of national identity, and also a militarization of politics during the Cold War that the United States and the Soviet Union supported the two sides of the elite and military rulers largely in these uh, governing these countries. So another reason that I like to put the emphasis on and discuss it is Islam, that is religion. To what extent Islam as a cultural system, not simply as a religion, but as a cultural system, and also what has come to be known as Islamism. Islamism is an Islamist, and Islamism are new terms. When I studied in the United States in the 1960s, the terms did not exist in any textbook or analytic article about the Middle East or the Islamic world at all, which means transforming faith or religion into an ideology, into a utopian ideology that promises to solve all the problems. To what extent uh, the, uh, the problems of uh, uh, the, the, 
democratic deficit in the region, to what extent it's actually related to religion. I don't mean to be reductionist. Obviously, these other, the colonial background, ethnic and religious fragmentation, tribalism, the lack of national identity, militarization of politics, all of these things are important. But in my personal experience, in my personal experience and also contact with a variety of people over the years, I would say uh, Islam as a religion which in the past couple of decades and perhaps going even back to 1920s, beginning of uh, transformation of the religion into an ideology. And I have to add here that during the Cold War, the United States in its foreign policy was very supportive of Islam, even when it was presented as a radical idea, because it was against communism. So communism was a force that, Islam was a force that contained communism, and therefore it was supported. Just to remind you, the most uh, surreal part of this US support for Islamism was during the 1980s, when the Muslim, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the people who later on came to be known as the Taliban or uh, Osama bin Laden and his friends, Ronald Reagan described them as freedom fighters equivalent to our founding fathers. And they received vast amount of uh, economic and military assistance from the United States. Taliban, Taleb means the student, the pursuit of religious knowledge. The schools that trained young Afghan kids, all boys, uh, in Pakistan, Saudi Arabia and the United States supported them extensively. And in other words, the, if from this pers perspective of uh, giving them a radical ideology, including self-sacrifice, was propagated with the complete support of the United States. And it made sense at the time. If, regardless of value orientation, regardless of where we stand in terms of our normative preferences, at the time, if the, if the enemy was communism, if the enemy was the Soviet Union, and these were the people who were ready to die in defeating and humiliating the Soviet Union, and they actually did make a contribution to the defeat of the Soviet Union in Afghanistan. And yet, once the Soviet Union disintegrated and they withdrew from Afghanistan, the United States dropped them like a dairy diaper, <laughs> literally. The George Bush, the first, the father, was in power. They immediately withdrew American. So from 1992, 9-11, <laughs> September 11, Afghanistan didn't exist and it was not recognized. Enough. Even though the people who came to power and took over that state, for 10 years, they received massive support. They estimated, based on the CIA sources I have seen, about over $7 billion from the United States, and the money was matched by Saudi Arabia. And the Wahhabism, the ideology came from Saudi Arabia, military training and money came from the United States as well as Saudi Arabia. So in that sense, they benefited from this. Uh, uh, what is in uh, what happened in the in the region with respect to you know, you know, Islam uh, in the contemporary world in the world we live in all traditional cultures face the challenge of increasing plurality of lifestyles and values we feel it here. It virtually every place in the world. And the internet and satellite television have made a fantastic contribution to the globalization of these diverse lifestyles and deconstruction of the taboos. Whether you live in a village in Africa or you live in San Francisco, you live in Cairo, you have access to over 100 television channels. So this the, the revolution of information on, without any question has created the kind of awareness you know, in the world that is obviously you know, unprecedented. So this information revolution that the arrival of satellite television in Arabic language took the region by storm, 
boosting access to information, breaking taboos, and motivating a whole industry of writers, actors, directors, and producers of dramas, comedies, game shows, music videos, and news for television. No question about it. You go to Turkey, you go to all over you know, the region. Al Jazeera, the television channel that we even get it here, it's an example of what I'm you know, talking about. So in a number of Arab countries, particularly Egypt and Tunisia, when the Islamists were prevented from political activities during the military dictatorship, they could use the mosque to gather and spread their message. You cannot close the mosque. That would, no regime would want to, to do that. So in Egypt under Mubarak, the Muslim Brotherhood was banned as a political party, but it was allowed to establish a vast charity network that uh, operated clinics, helped educate poor children, and supported disadvantaged families. And the money for it came even from outside Saudi Arabia. The Persian, the Arab states of the Persian Gulf, with massive resources at their disposal as a result of all, they contributed a great deal. The same people in Saudi Arabia who contributed a great deal of resources to the movement against the Soviet Union in Afghanistan, they also assisted the Muslim Brotherhood or religious organizations in the Arab world, but largely being engaged in social relations and social uh, uh, in, uh, so, in, at the same time that secular parties could not take in the demonstration, the, the, in the 2010 and 2011 demonstrations that undoubtedly the internet and satellite television played a significant role. Initially, initially, young people and women modernist, secularist, who, in my opinion, represent a minority of the population, but educated and urban-based sectors of the population, they were the ones who started the movement against, whether it was in, in Tunisia or in Egypt or even in Syria, you know, initially. When they started you know, the movements, it was the, they followed no charismatic leader, which was unusual in the politics of, of the region. Yet, when the dictators were ousted and elections were held in Tunisia and Egypt, Islamists were the winners. And here is, and the secular parties could not take power because they were fragmented and had little contact with the urban and rural poor, largely because of the deep social cultural gap between them. What we are seeing in the Middle East today, all Middle Eastern countries, we have, a, uh, I would say generally speaking, a minority of population that I'd refer to them as modernists or secularists, representing a variety of liberal leftist social democratic you know, perspectives. They are very much influenced by modernization in the West. So when they talk about democracy, they mean constitutional democracy. They mean human rights-based democracy. While the Islamists, when they talk about democracy, they mean majoritarian democracy, which majoritarian dem democracy began as a majoritarian movement in the United States. Even the majority, majority of the eligible voters, that is, white Protestants property people could only vote, and yet it was a revolution because for the first time, legitimacy came from the voting in the population, the same all over Europe. And from that beginning, it took the Western world over a century, a century and a half, to transform it, the suffragist movement, the anti-slavery, the abolitionist movement, the civil rights movement, and at the present time, the sexual equality, gender equality movement. It took over 100, 150 years in the United States and Europe to go from majoritarianism, majority democracy, to uh, human rights-based democracy, or what we refer to constitutional democracy. 
But the model that if you live in Egypt, if you live in Iran, if you live in Turkey, and you're educated, and you have studied in the United States, so you know Europe and all that, when you think about democracy, you mean gender equality, you mean gay rights, you mean uh, human rights-based democracy. In other words, the majority cannot come to power and decide what is in the best interest of the society and impose it on others. These two perspectives are really competing with each other in every... And then when it comes to receiving the votes, the Islamists are better organized, they definitely have more money, and also they have far greater uh, understanding of the feelings and sensibilities and alienation of the urban poor and rural areas. Remember, something very dramatic has happened all over the Middle East. The population of the Middle Eastern countries over the past 30 years has doubled. Egypt has gone from 40 million to 80 million. Iran has gone from 35 million to 72 million. In Turkey, in Syria, in Iraq, every one of them. Which means the population is extremely... 75% of the Egyptians are under 35 years old. The same in Iran. You know. So this demographic revolution, and at the same time that this demographic revolution has taken place, a different kind of revolution, movement from the rural to urban areas. So you have Tehran is the population of 12 million, but 80% of them live in southern Tehran. Egypt has a population of 15 million. Probably 75, 80% of them again live in what we call urban poor areas. So when it comes to, with respect to education, the standard of living, uh, they're much more susceptible to an ideology, to religion, that connects with the religious sensibilities than the liberals or the leftists or social democratic people who are presenting ideas largely borrowed from the West, of course using local vocabulary, but the fundamentally Western ideas. So the communication between the Islamists and the masses of people is far more effective than the uh, uh, the communication between the secularists and modernists. Another thing that we all know, is, it's the same probably in Europe and the United States, when you're intensely committed to something, when it's ideology, whether it's leftist or rightist and all that, but the intensity of preference leads to a kind of unity, leads to a kind of solidarity among the people who follow that line of thinking. While for liberals, for a progressive and I would say the secularist people with whom I personally have identified all my life, uh, they, they are far more fragmented and divided because it's far more difficult for them to agree because of their ideas and because of their commitment to pluralism, respect for individual preference and so forth. It's the same in Egypt when the election took place, the, Islamic, the Islamists had one candidate. The secularists had 11 candidates, <laughs> literary. Yeah. In Iran, after the revolution, the religious were all under the command of Ayatollah Khomeini, and they followed him. The leftists, and the, the leftists at the time, this was before the collapse of the Soviet Union, they saw that, uh, they said, oh, religion is the opiate of the people. According to Karl Marx, religious people are not going to take over the state. You know. They are going to be marginalized and rejected by modernization process. So the real enemy is the national bourgeoisie. So they organized against the liberals, the social democratic type, thinking that sooner or later the religious people, the clerical class, is going to be marginalized and ousted from the political competition. The people who, are, who really represent a competitive party to the leftists, to Marxist. They represented you know, a, a small part of the population. So what happened, what I want to say, this fragmentation and division, this atomization of the liberals and the leftists is it really a real problem with respect to the ability to compete at the present time with the... Yes. So here, what we are actually seeing in... Uh, then, then when you... They ask people before I, uh, uh, I think it was uh, 
James Madison in the Federalist Papers who said uh, the oppression, the real threat to democracy is actually the majority rule. And Tocqueville said, talked about the tyranny of the majority you know, at the time. In other words, the majority can become very tyrannical and still feel justified because they represent the majority of the people. And that conflict, it's really irresolvable, that is to say, the record, particularly in the modern times, that the, the pluralism, the pluralistic uh, the nature of you know, values and choices and so forth throughout, can, it's in Egypt, in the beginning of the, uh, uh, the, the, the revolution, or the, the demonstrations against uh, uh, Hosni Mubarak, uh, there is no independent judiciary. I can say there is, except for Israel and to some extent uh, Turkey, there is no independent judiciary in any Middle Eastern country. And then when there is no independent judiciary, the hot button issues, issues having to do with sexuality, with gender equality, with individual rights, with pluralism, you know, in, in the Western world still there are hot button issues, but ultimately they are settled in the court and because of the consensus and commitment of the society to constitutionalism, no matter how much they distort it, they accept it because they don't question its legitimacy. While in the Middle East, like other, there is really no independent you know, judiciary, so the division of the, in the society on hot button issues, particularly issues that involve cultural and emotional and sexual uh, or connotation you know, as distinct from economic issues, you know, uh, they're extremely difficult to settle. And that's the major conflict between the secularists and the Islamists who won the election in Egypt or the Islamists who won the election in Tunisia and the secularists are socio-cultural, not economic. On economic Islam, for example, if you're interested in economic equality, the Quran will give you all kinds of verses. Equality with respect to ethnicity, with respect to tribalism, with respect to uh, you know, any economic, but when it comes to women, and when it comes to uh, you know, the Sharia and women, when, it, the, when equality stops. That is to say, religious minorities, women, and of course, a slavery. You know, it's this, it was the same thing in the Old Testament and the New Testament, and even though, to my knowledge, no Christian or Jew or Muslim openly defends slavery, but the books have not been edited. You know. <laughs> the support for slavery and the recognition of slavery as a natural condition and all that is these Abrahamic uh, uh, text over and over. There's no question about that. So when it comes to, again, democracy, let me say that if you live in an authoritarian country, as I can, as as, as a young man, I did, and for until to, to this day, I have that feeling that you end up uh, idealizing and romanticizing democracy, and you initially think about democracy in terms of majority rule, popular sovereignty, political equality. You don't really get into social cultural issues because these are late issues, even in advanced democracies. Uh, so you idealize it, and yet, uh, as, uh, but when you live in a democratic society and you pay attention to policy making and the conflicts and the difficulties, you begin to identify with what Winston Churchill said about democracy, that it is the worst form of government except for all those other forms that have been tried. <laughs> in other words, the idealization of democracy, that this is the answer to, but once it's on the scene, in fact, it leads to greater fragmentation. It's really sad to say, it's really painful to say for anyone interested in human rights and democratic issues, but in Iraq, under Saddam Hussein, which was a fascistic regime, religious minorities, particularly Christians, 
they had more freedom, they had more security than they do today. In Egypt, Coptics, who represent over 10% of the population, they had more freedom under the dictatorship of the military in Egypt than they did under the Islamist, the Muslim Brotherhood. And Muslim Brotherhood is ruling in the name of democracy, and today, in, in, in Iraq. So that is really a painful, why? Because the auto, autocratic states, they just want submission from you. If you're not interested in politics, they don't give a damn about you. While the totalitarian state, whether rightist or leftist or Islamist or atheist, whatever, they want to make a new human being out of you. As Lenin said, the new man, you know. That is to say, they become interested in your private space. That is what you do in your home, with the, in your personal relations, it becomes an issue for the, for the state. And therefore, suddenly religious minorities who were living their lives in Iraq before the American invasion in 2003, they were the, after the, the takeover of the Shi'is in Iraq, it, the majority of the close to 70% of the people, George Bush in decided, uh, when George Bush said, uh, God and literally, that's what he said. He said, God instructed him to invade Iraq. The only person, the only people who echoed and used his, uh, his claim were the Friday prayer leaders in Tehran who said God used George Bush to get rid of our enemy Saddam Hussein. And what George Bush gave us, a majority Shi'i rule in Iraq, was the ultimate gift of Jesus Christ to the Iranian people. <laughs> and this, and it sounds a little <laughs> odd, but it's really the reality. Virtually all the people who ended up ruling Iraq, they were exiles in Iran. The first troops who entered Iraq in 2011, 12,000 soldiers, they were trained and equipped by Iranians. And Iranians were so helpful to the Bush administration that the, Bush, the American the naval commanders in the Persian Gulf region thanked the Iranians. In other words, Iran had two enemies, Saddam Hussein on the one side, Taliban on the other side. George Bush got rid of them both. And Iran became incredibly arrogant, incredibly arrogant. And just, just as George Bush did, they thought it was an act of God, and they probably believed in it. At least some of them you know, believed in it. So, in, in this, uh, so when they ask people, there have been a survey research in uh, the, the three political scientists from uh, Princeton University and Georgetown University, they conducted two studies in the Middle East in late 2007 and again in 2011, asking people about the democratic the preferences they have. Overwhelming majority of the people say, we prefer democracy. And yet, uh, they ask them about Sharia, the Islamic laws. They ask them about gender equality. They ask them about capital punishment. They ask them about human rights, religious minorities. The answers are contradictory. In other words, the division exists within the individual. Democracy as an abstraction is very appealing and is very interesting, but the moment that it's going to be translated into recognizing a plurality of values and perspectives, including religious minorities, gender equality, sexual equality, the response is, becomes very schizophrenic. This is really the, gender, the reality of most, not all, I would say, but significant sectors of the public that doing so very research is saying that what do you think about democracy? That answer in itself is not really sufficient about how they would. Uh... So the, the impediments that uh, can exist in the uh, advancement of, of the, I can add that like Christian fundamentalists in the United States 
Islamists emphasize family values, social conservatism, and attracting followers from different social classes. In the region where most people are Muslims, they also offer the word of God. It is a value system with a wide reach and one that offers comfort and solace to millions who feel caught up between tradition and modernity. This tradition, the being caught up between tradition and modernity, I'm not talking about the society at large in an existential sense. That's as much a reality as it is in the society at large. And it's not really all that different from what happened in the West if we go back to the Enlightenment and study how uh, culture change is the slowest kind of change we see in, in the society. So when uh, Samuel Huntington, the Harvard professor, wrote an article in 1993-1994 in in called Clash of Civilizations. And then later on it became a book and it received a great deal of you know, attention. That there is a civilizational conflict between the Islamic world and the Western world. He also referred to India and China, but first and foremost, Islamic. There is his observation, he is the same man for I think many of you in this room should know, he is the same man who uh, provided us with the domino theory during the Vietnam War. The same man. And there is a, and his statement is a falsehood that contains an element of truth. There is a clash of civilizations, but it's within the culture. It's clash of culture be be between the people who want to pursue a modern course and the people who are committed to their tradition in every Middle Eastern country. You go to Turkey, today the idea of whether the hijab or wearing, some people find it outrageous, others think it's the right. You go to Iran, you go to Egypt, in every Islamic country, when it comes to particularly social, cultural you know, issues, that we see this division. And this division undoubtedly existed in every, in the Western country that went through uh, uh, the transition from autocracy, from transition from simple majoritarian rule to human rights based you know, democracy. So many secularists when throughout the Middle East and again survey research so many secularists distrust the Islamists and do not believe that they're willing to accept the democratic norms. They say they believe in democracy one person, one vote, one time. The majority comes to power. That's exactly what happened in Egypt. The majority comes to power and says, the majority has decided to put an end to this or that practice. So suddenly the same people who had rebelled against uh, uh, Hosni Mubarak in Egypt, we saw what happened. It, the, it was an outpouring of opposition. And they, represent, they did not represent, remember that Islamists did not represent a majority of Egyptian people. They represented the majority of voters. You know, the, tot, the participation in Egyptian uh, the presidential election was a little over 50%. And in the initial election, the Islamists received 25% of the vote. 25%. But the fragmentation on the other side was so massive. As I said, there were 10 or 11 you know, candidates. So in, here, this uh, distrust that I would say it exists, it's the struggle. In, uh, so in a more general sense, when a society moves away from a static traditional lifestyle, that uh, diverse or competing ideas appear the, that the role of individual or the role of agency is shaping events. And it is happening in every Middle Eastern country and the struggle undoubtedly continues. And then when it comes to, uh, there is uh, the most important debate going on in the Middle Eastern countries is really within Islam. That people who study Islam and interpret Islam in a literal sense 
and those Muslims who consider themselves committed Muslims and they interpret it in a historical, dynamic, evolutionary sense. Exactly the same thing that we saw in the Western world. That's why religion, from its inception, when it comes to social political movements, religion has always been a double-edged sword. You go to the anti-slavery abolitionist movement, religion is on both sides. You go to suffragist movement, religion is on both sides. It's the same in, in the Middle East today. And there is really no debate. If I go, I, I, in, in 1980, I was invited to give a talk at University of Tehran. They attacked me. They, people helped me to get out to save my life. Because the moment you question the, uh, the, the divine nature of what religious people believe, that's the end of the discussion. You know. So people who really the, the, the engage in a, the most important debate in the Middle Eastern countries, the literalist readers as well as opposing the liberal readers. That Quran has to be read in its historical context. The general ethical norms are there, but the laws and edicts and regulations must be adopted to changing time and circumstances. Uh, this is the debate because they don't question, in other words, they use etymology, they use uh, a, a variety of methods and in, in the Western world we refer to as deconstruction or postmodernism. They use, they interpret the language in order to, uh, to give it an evolving you know, value as the single literal interpretation. And in Islam, it is very hard. This is exactly where the difficulty comes in. In Judaism, the, the, the Mediterranean religion, that, the text that I'm familiar with, the Old Testament and the New Testament, Judaism, is, in the beginning, is mythology. In the beginning, is mythology. And Christianity, again, the, the, the prophet himself didn't really write anything. And then several writers produced the New Testament. And neither one was a ruler. Neither one was a manager of power during their own lifetime. Muhammad is entirely a different story. Muhammad Islam begins as a political movement. First, he is in uh, Mecca. And he is a, undoubtedly from a, from a completely the secular, historical, political you know, perspective. He's obviously a brilliant man. You know. And if you know, uh, he learns a great deal about religion, monotheism, from Judaism and Christianity, he is a trader between the age of 25 to 40. For 15 years, he was working for a wealthy woman, traveling to the shores of Mediterranean, and the shores of Mediterranean were really centers of preaching Judaism, Christianity, and he learns a great deal from it. And there were Jewish communities in Mecca at the time. So he presents these ideas, he organizes people. During the first 10 years, Quran is divided between the Mecca verses and Medina verses. Medina where he establishes the first Islamic you know, state. In the beginning, he's organizing people. He is very, uh, uh, I would say, Accommodating, peaceful, uh, tolerant, acceptance of diversity and all that because he's organizing people with a new idea. But 10 years, so the Mecca uh, verses are very useful to the liberals who want to use the text in order to say there is no contradiction or incompatibility between Islam and religion. You go to Medina, he is the manager of power. He is an army, he is conquering, and Islam is expanding. He becomes the head of the state and the, head, the leader of the army. And at that time, the verses go through a dramatic change. And all of these differences, and so people can use the text really to make a case for whatever they want to believe in. And there is absolutely nothing new about that in the Mediterranean 
religious tradition. You go to Israel, you go to the West Bank, people read the Torah and tell you that the biblical land of Israel is from the Nile to Euphrates. Imagine, from Nile to Euphrates. And then you also go to, go to the get at the Tipper University and talk to the people who are genuinely committed to their religion and they have a completely different interpretation. Just as Shakespeare said it beautifully, he said the devil himself can quote the scripture, the scripture to make a case for himself. You know. And that is for people who study you know, religion we could easily you know, see. This is exactly what is happening in, uh, in the Islamic world. This is where the debate is important in my opinion, it, not the debate between the secularists, not between the debate between Mansoor and the, the Ayatollah. It's a debate between one Ayatollah and another Ayatollah. You know. In Iran, it's very important really that you don't read about it here. In Iran, no, over the past 400 years that Shiism was forced on people as the religion of the state and the clerics gained a position in the affairs of the state and became very influential in the society. No king, no political, no government over the past until the Islamic revolution dared really to attack the religious people. More religious people, more ayatollahs, more clerics have been convicted, executed, imprisoned in the theocratic order than ever before. And these are the people who question the interpretation of that is turning the religion into an ideology. Ayatollah Sistani, the leading Shi'i leader of Iraq, he hates the Iranians. He thinks they're blasphemous, <laughs> they're corrupting the religion and all that. And he, he is completely opposed to the idea of uh, making religion the ideology of the state and imposing it on others, even though he is a leading interpreter of, of the uh, Islamic religion and its edicts. So in, uh, I wished I had, uh, this, there was something that I wanted to, <laughs> uh, I wanted to show you at the, the, the end of my talk to, uh, that, uh, you know, uh, Raphael, the painter, the 15th century, you know, painter, has a wonderful, fantastic, you know, uh, painting. It's, it's called, uh, uh, it's, the, in the middle of this painting, Aristotle and Plato are standing next to each other. And Plato is looking up, holding his, his uh, dialogue. And Aristotle is holding his hand like this. It, he has ethics, you know. Yes, the, his, his book. But Aristotle being a secular character and Plato being a utopian metaphysical by our uh, you know, standards. <coughs> uh, uh, so the argument that ultimately the authority comes from above or we are on our own there is nothing new about that. We go back to Plato and Aristotle and the argument, that's where it, it began. And yet, overwhelming majority of the people in the Middle Eastern countries, this debate, looking up and saying we are on our own, this is really a debate among the elite. I would say absolutely no more than 10% of the population in any Middle Eastern you know, country. The vast majority of the people are really neither here or there. The vast majority of the people are more concerned with their economic needs, with their children, with their education, with their health care, and of course ideas and morality and God, all those things are important. But I have I had two uh, pictures to show you at the end. One was uh, uh, Raphael's School of Athenians, and the other one was Peter Schumann. Peter Schumann was a bread and puppet leader in our own you know, state, and he has a lovely painting, he refers to it as the Diagonal Man. Uh, and the Diagonal Man, it's, uh, is really a, a, a metaphor for, uh, this is, you won't see it here, 
But this is the school of Athenians. Uh, here, you know, Plato and Aristotle are standing next to each other from that larger painting going up and saying we are on our own. But I would say this is a debate for a very small minority of the people. If we look at the survey research or traveling or talking to the people, what we really see on the part of the vast majority of the people is the diagonal man of Schumann. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, it's metaphorically, it's not, uh, so the debate in, that is going on all over uh, the Middle Eastern countries is how long it will take for, uh, from, to the extent that as a, a student of politics, a student of history, I dare to make any predictions, or maybe it's because I'm a, an incurable optimist, uh, but I genuinely believe that pluralism is inevitable. I think sooner or later, this one-dimensional way of being and doing, there is only one way of being and, and doing, is on its way out. But there is a price, there, there is no question about it, that it could even involve violence, as we are, we are witnessing it, as it did in the Western world, no, for, since the Enlightenment. Uh, but uh, it's, a, uh, it's really a matter of time from my perspective, uh, since I won't be alive to prove or disprove, <laughs> disprove whether it takes five years or 10 years or 20 years or 50 years. Right now, if we look, giving you some specific, uh, those of you who are interested in literature, if we look at the, the most important movement in the Middle East today is the women's movement in Iran. It's really a fantastic movement. When we look at the number of novels written by Middle Easterners, some of the leading and fascinating novels are written by women, you know. And issues, all the taboos, just as in the Western world, that the taboos were first and foremost deconstructed in literature, because in literature it's more acceptable than in, in an essay in the New York Times and all that. The same thing is happening. Young people do the information revolution. They're very much influenced. When we say influence in the West, it doesn't mean that they want to imitate the West. It means certain values are universal. You know, if, if a human being has a particular kind of sexual tendency, it doesn't matter where you are. You know, whether you're in Africa or Latin America, if you have to be in the closet, it is simply a matter of time before the possibility of coming as, out of the, the closet. So, in the few, in spite of the violence, in spite of the difficulties, in spite of this fundamental conflict between modernity and tradition, I'm pretty much convinced that whether it's 10 years or 20 years or 50 years, the traditionalists are going to be marginalized and modern values are going to be more accepted by the gender people because, again, it's my personal normative orientation, it is more natural. You know, it is more natural. Equality is more natural than the slavery. You know. Gender equality between men and women is more natural than the tradition of inequality that it's... Uh, so I would say artists, you know, writers, intellectuals, political activists, particularly human rights you know, activists are very busy in the Middle East, even though we don't really read about them. We read a great deal about you know, violence and in, intolerance. But I would say in the Middle East today, for the very first time in the history of the region, human rights discourse, as I've served on the advisory board of Human Rights Watch for over 20 years, and I've, I've been a member of Amnesty International since 1963, when I was an undergraduate you know, student. The discourse of human rights throughout the Middle East is the most important discourse. It's penetrating the society. It doesn't mean that it will be easily translated into behavior or action. But for the very first time, instead of talking about imperialism or colonialism or conspiratorial theories, those things are also there, but young people, particularly women, are more and more attracted to human rights discourse and trying to adopt human rights norms and values 
to their own local you know, tradition. In that sense, uh, contrary to what we watch on television, which is very true, which is very painful, which is very tragic, but this is a price that Middle Eastern people have to pay if they want to live in a more civilized and tolerant world. And I think they're paying it. Thank you very much. Okay, let me uh, please raise questions and comments, and I will continue to <laughs> give you my wishes. <laughs> Before you start, could you get the professor uh, some water, maybe? Yeah, there's water right in the lecture. Okay, yeah, there's a Thank you. I bet he could use some water. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. <laughs> like a glass of wine would even be better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Please. Would you believe that Turkey is an exception? They went from the state Arabic countries and Iran are today to a much more modern situation thanks to Ataturk and his views that were forced upon the Turks rather than debated in democratic forums. No question. Among the Islamic countries in the Middle East, I don't know, Turkey is definitely ahead of the rest of them. No question about it. But the conflicts are still there. That today, if this is, I would say, uh, the Justice and Development Party, that with the leadership of it, their interpretation of Islam is qualitatively different from the interpretation of Islamists in Egypt or in, in, in Iran. Yes, the, the most important, you know, Aratol came to power more or less at the same time that Reza Shah Pahlavi came to. And Aratol was the hero for Reza Shah, the founder of the Pahlavi. And yet, Aratol was very interested in institution building. So when he died, the institutions continued the process of secularization and modernity. Reza Shah was a modernist, a secularist, but a, an uncompromising autocrat. So when he died, everything collapsed. His son was exactly the same. The Pahlavis in Iran had a fantastic opportunity to move the country in the same direction as, as Ataturk and his followers did. But here, the autocratic political culture dominated the Pahlavi rule, while in Turkey, there were many coups in Turkey, but shortly after the coup, there was recognition of pluralism, acceptance of at the semi-democratic you know, elections, and to Turkey today is undoubtedly uh, a model for the rest of the Islamic world. And the fact that the Turks from the very beginning, at least a significant sectors of the population, they really want to identify with Europe. Even the Muslim, the, the, the Islamists of Turkey, the, uh, they desperately want to join the European Union. So in that sense, Turkey is definitely a model and different from the other Islamic countries in the Middle East. Please. Um, isn't it peculiar to the United States that we equate a democratic form of government with human rights, um, encouraging human rights? There are human rights. Um, you know, uh, countries that have other models of government, constitutional monarchies, for example, where human rights are as important. But it seems that we th seem to think that in order to you know, have human rights, we need a democracy. But if the, the, without democracy, they cannot be human rights. Monarchy could particularly that if you're talking about in Norway or Great Britain, the monarch doesn't have any power. Correct. So it is. Oops. It's a constitution. You know, I, the, I, the problem for the, with respect to American foreign policy and, and democ democracy promotion is not so much the promotion of democracy as an idea. That's wonderful. It's the idea that you could use force to impose it on people. It doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Please. Uh, how do you overcome the tribalism that exists uh, in the Mideast? You know, for Af Afghanistan and, and uh, well, the Middle East in general and the world in general, the, the tribalism is uh, is the basic fundamental reason why we disagree with each other. And uh, your comments on it, 
it's always been controlled by men, let's say, you know. And and your last comments on on the power of the women uh, of the world were very very cogent, I think, to the progress that's been made in, in recent years. But if we compare tri tribalism as as uh, a source of identity, yeah. And today, tribalism in the Middle East has significantly diminished in comparison with 20 years ago, 30 years ago. So with education, with urbanization, with communication and all that, that identity is actually disappearing, but not as quickly as you and I wish it to see. And also, it's not only tribal. You go to Egypt, there is very little tribalism in Egypt. And there is actually a sense of national identity in Egypt. You go to Iran, there is very little tribalism. There are Kurds and some Baluch altogether, probably 10% of the population, largely on the borders of the country toward Iraq and Pakistan. But over 90% of the people have the same you know, religion and the same There's sense of Egypt, you're saying. the same Iran. Oh, Iran. Yeah. These two countries, yeah, these Iran. two ancient, you know, and yet the same many prop impediments to democracy in these countries seem to be as destructive as we see it in other countries. But yeah. it is diminishing to the extent that when people vote, in Iraq, for example, a good example, the United States is sponsored the elections. But in Iraq, overwhelming majority of the Shi'is voted for the Shi'i candidate, Sunnis for the Sunni candidates, Kurds for the court candidate. The idea of I vote for the performance of the individual, or I vote for the ideology they are going to, the program they are going to implement, didn't exist, simply because identity politics based on religion or ethnicity, ethnicity dominated. It, it's, and the change, you know, even in, uh, in the United States is still there is a division between the South and the North. It's, it's slow. It's in Great Britain, the Scots sometimes talk about <laughs> independence. Uh, Th there is nothing new about, you know, in th th all European countries, but tribal communities through, you know, time and education and modern development and urbanization, national identity. And I would say it's so ironic that Europe exported the idea of nationalism to the rest of the world. When Europeans went to the Middle East and Af Af uh, uh, the Asia and Africa, there was no idea of nationalism, national identity. So they took the idea to those countries. They, the nationalism became um, popularized and it was used as an abstraction to fight the colonial power, to create independence and all that. And then Europe itself seems to be moving toward transnationalism. <laughs> that here they want to transcend nationalism. In other words, if we want to find one area of the world where integration seems to be taking place, having common, can you imagine Europe at war with itself for centuries? Now for 60 years, they have lived in peace, they have common currency, that they have one passport. It was unimaginable to think of such a Europe in the post-World War I period. So I would say in many other, these areas, these, uh, 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 these accomplishments in the world, again from a normative point of view, they inspire others. It takes time. Human beings don't change it. It, it is one thing I, I have watched, uh, I did all my undergraduate and graduate work, I was very much involved in the politics, the protest movement of the 60s and all that. It was not too difficult to see, for example, men to recognize and accept the issue of gender equality intellectually as a concept. But translating it into behavior, translating it into concrete, it takes time. It take, it's the same, you know, uh, 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 the leftists who, who thought the, in, in the Middle Eastern countries who thought they were modernists, they believed in gender equality, in their concrete behavior, in their political organizations, in their politics, they were as piggish as the rest. No, it's a, it's a reality that it's, it's one thing to be convinced intellectually, it's entirely another thing to live 
what you have come to believe as, as a decency or not. Please. So along that line, that line of thinking, um, uh, I'm not very familiar with the Koran and uh, Muhammad's prohibitions, but I wonder what the odds are in your lifetime or my lifetime that women in Saudi Arabia will be able to drive their own car. <laughs> and, and I, I ask because we all laugh, but they are allowed to drive. Absolutely. And, and yeah. people know that. And um, there have been articles recently um, in the media about, you know, the uh, Saudi economy is hindered in many parts for many different reasons, you know, guest workers and all that. Uh, they don't have a, you know, they have uh, producing too many, um, you know, uh, people with degrees, but then they don't want to go and, you know, do, do physical labor, so they have the guest workers. But also there's so many people tied up with shuttling women around for literally, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of people are being employed as chauffeurs and, and you know, the brother and the brother-in-law and the sister, you know, or, or, you know, the husband and the, the grandfather, they have to drive the woman everywhere. And, you know, the women aren't allowed to drive. They, they've had some small protests, women driving. But I just, you know, it just seems like, I, I, how can you use the Quran to justify women not driving when the automobile wasn't, you know, just, just the It's the only Islamic, the 1.4 <laughs> billion Muslims in the world. Saudi Arabia is the only country. And it's completely hypocritical because the daughters and wives of the ruling elite, when they go to Europe and America, they drive the Mercedes and BMWs just... <laughs> Absolutely. They're hypocritical to the core. And the Saudi Arabia woman, for, it's, it's a matter of time because it's so absurd. It's so completely pathological that the Saudi, very few people really uh, could defend that in public and also more, the more educated woman in Saudi Arabia than ever before. It's in Iran, for example, in Iran today, there are close to 4 million university students. 63% of them are women in all walks of life. Except that in the Quran, they didn't say you can't be a pilot. <laughs> you can't be a physicist. You can't be a scientist. You can't be a television announcer. So they are doing all these things. But they say you can't be a judge. You can't dance. You can't sing. So it's these contradictions and hypocrisies are going to <laughs> run against the wall. It's a, it's really a matter of, and then they have in Saudi Arabia, in other theocratic states, and particularly in Iran, because Iran has really a very significant modern middle class. They have created I, the most hypocritical political order I could imagine that people pretend to live a certain way in public space, and they live a very different kind of life in their yeah. It was, so the totalitarian and people who want to, uh, who think through indoctrination, through propaganda, they can impose a value orientation on you. The Russians, the communists did it in the Soviet Union, and the Mao Zedong tried to do it in China. It was a disaster. To me, I always, I was just telling my wife the other day that uh, when we look at the Soviet system, that they were in power for seven years. Regardless of the claim with respect to social equality and justice and economic issues and other. But after seven years, it was the most unethical political order, the most unethical political elite on earth. That literally within years, in a country where there was no... Uh, private ownership of means of production. There are more billionaires in Russia today. <laughs> Literally, with, where did they come from? How did they get the money? So the hypocrisy of the people who claim the utopian, you know, uh, claim as Iranians do, as the Saudis do, it has very little to do with the way people live their lives. And sooner or later, it will break up. You know, I know with respect to details more about Iran than anywhere else. The, uh, the Prince Bandar, who was Saudi ambassador to the United States, that he was supposed to represent you know, the 
the Quranic edicts and all. He had a house in Colorado with 20 bathrooms. And one American diplomat, a close friend who had visited him, he said, you get the best vodka, <laughs> the best drinks <laughs> at Prince Pandas mansion in Colorado. So the leaders of these countries are really very hypocritical. And the people know that. And yet there is this base of a traditionalism, this fanaticism, that they use it in order to keep, to, it's a matter of time, in my opinion, when I might not be alive, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> Please. What do you think will happen with these nuclear negotiations? <laughs> the sanctions were very effective. And the sanctions were effective in the sense of not only creating serious economic problems for the society at large, but also for the regime. And for a country like Iran, that the major source of income for the country is export of oil. And the sanctions were very, very effective in limiting Iran's oil export from two and a half million barrels a day to about 700 thousand barrels a day and even receiving money from that became increasingly difficult because of sanctions and bank. There was also a, a popular uh, resentment of the regime and the sanctions. The Iranian regime is, uh, each, when, when we generalize about the Middle East, I focused on Islam because I was focusing on what we can find in terms of general trends and conditions and tendencies. But when you study each country has its own peculiarities, had its own native attribute. In Iran they have created a system that periodically, not always, periodically they have undemocratic but competitive elections. That only those who are completely committed to the regime are allowed to run for a public office, but I would say with two or three exceptions that there was charge of cheating and fraud. Uh, so people end up, people who really reject the regime, they end up for voting for the lesser of four, five, six evils. This time, Rouhani, who is, first of all, he is an educated guy. I have read all his writings. He has a law degree. He has a PhD from Great Britain. He has written extensively. He is, I refer to him as, as the Muslim Henry Kissinger, you know. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. When you read him, he is very aware and very understanding of power politics. But there is no reference to human rights or civil liberties in his you know, writings. So he thought that the sanctions and the confrontation with the United States is threatening the stability of the regime. So he advocated a more moderate, a more conciliatory position and the readiness to compromise. And contrary to, uh, it was a major surprise it, among all the observers, not only in Iran but also abroad, that he won the election. There were seven candidates and he won the election in the first round. So the Iranian regime and the Bush administration, the uh, Obama administration, they have a common interest to resolve this issue peacefully. Whether they will do, whether the Iranians will live up to the commitments they have made remains to be seen. But I think they are ready to compromise, not in the sense that they will give up the infrastructure of their nuclear program, but they will freeze it at the present time and wait to see what happens in the future. Now in the future, if they feel more secure, it may well be that they could compromise. If they become more ambitious or less secure, they might pick it up again. It's, we don't know for sure, but the fact that this, this agreement could freeze the Iranian nuclear program at the, its present stage, it's an accomplishment. And I would say in a more general sense, if the United States and European countries are genuinely interested in uh, preventing proliferation of nuclear weapons, they have to create a more secure environment you know, in the world. Bush, by invading two countries in the Middle East, created massive insecurity. And when people feel insecure and the technology has become available, the non-proliferation treaty 
was established 40 years ago, 45 years ago. At the time, it was unimaginable that countries like Iran or North Korea or Pakistan would be able to enrich uranium. But technology has advanced dramatically, and they cannot change the treaty because the treaty is based on consensus. The 185, 186 members, they get together every five years. They want to make some revisions, but even one country voting against it will put an end to it. So I would say it's an accomplishment. And yet, whether this accomplishment will eventually lead to elimination of this threat remains to be seen. But war was not the answer. P apparently, when China was building nuclear weapon, a general went to President Eisenhower and said the Chinese are on the way to have the capacity to make the nuclear weapon. President Eisenhower said, what should we do? The general said, we should bomb them. And then General Eisenhower says, OK, what do we do after that if they restart the program because the technology is there, the, the, the science is there, resources are there, and scientists are there. And they said, we will bomb them again. So containment was used instead of you know, bombing them. So did Pakistan, Israel, Pakistan, India. They have nuclear power. In the Middle East, it is absolutely essential that they contain Iran, that they don't let Iran to have the capacity to make nuclear weapons. Because if Iran gets nuclear weapons, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Turkey, Jordan, or United Arab Emirates, all of these countries, they have the resources. They have the resources and the knowledge is there. So Obama, I think, has done the right thing. And in fact, the, the Iranians didn't appreciate him. When he came to power, the first thing he did, he wrote a letter to Ayatollah Khamenei, the supreme leader of Iran, and said, let's engage in negotiation without any uh, uh, expectations, without any precondition or not. They rejected it. They rejected it. They tried, they tried to negotiate with the United States in 2003 and 2004. Bush rejected it. Obama tried, in, when he came to power, Iranians rejected it. This is the first time that the two sides managed to get together, and they have come up with a formula that is promising. And yet there is nothing certain about how it will evolve. Um, Personally optimistic, but that's my problem. Maybe <laughs> 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 one time for one more question. Sure. I don't sure. Want to bring you out. Please. This is a follow-up question on, on the previous one, or what you just was speaking of. A friend of mine told me that Durrani, in a, used to be the head of a council which ordered the bombing of the Buenos Aires Israeli consulate in the 90s, which killed a great many people. Right. And if so, do you know anything about how he's changed, if he has? It's a, there, there's not... How is this, what is the rhetoric these days about Israel and bombing Israel out of existence? Is there is no question that the Iranian regime has been involved in terrorist acts abroad. But more than... They assassinated over 100 uh, Iranian activists uh, abroad in France, one in the United States, to, to, be, to, to give you an example, they had a list that the FBI came to visit me at Bennington College and said they have discovered the list in Germany that there were two or three people who were targeted for assassination and I was one of them if I need any help. <laughs> so there is no question that they have done that in Lebanon and else. But I would say in uh, in the past 10 years, in the past 10 years, uh, there is no evidence of Iranians being involved in acts of terror you know, abroad. In the beginning, for many years in Europe, in Latin America and elsewhere, they, they have been accused. But in the past 10 years, there is no the evidence that they have been involved. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, 
the U.S. For years. Where U.S. keeps more than the... No, terrorists. Like no, but, but they're supplying terrorists. Oh, as you mean, no, if you mean, but they don't kind of, but supply, for example, the Iranians are giving a great deal of military and economic assistance to Hezbollah in Lebanon. But Hezbollah is part of the government in Lebanon. But it's, if it's part of the government, you know, the, the members of parliament or prime minister and all that, they are not, terrorism, it, if we want to define terrorism, in that sense, the United States has committed acts of terror. I wouldn't consider that. You know, we have to define it. Terrorism means systematic violence against civilians in order to gain political advantage. And that's what Iranians did in Argentina, in France, in Germany, in Turkey, one in the United States. They have done that. But the idea of assisting a political group that considers itself uh, a revolutionary movement and it's acting openly and it's, you know, Hezbollah is part of the government in, in Lebanon. We could, we, could, we could refer to them as terrorists but then the definition of terrorism becomes so broad that uh, it ceases to have any meaning. So in, in the sense of the Iranian regime having its agents committing crime against innocent people abroad, they do it at home regularly, abroad. I would say in the past 10 years, the Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International, as well as the State Department, they study these things very systematically. If you read the, the State Department reports on the human rights situation and terrorism annually, until about 10 years ago, you see repeated references to Iran, and in my opinion, they are all accurate. But in the past 10 years, they are condemned for human rights violations at home. But committing acts of terror abroad is not part of the record. Okay. What I was wondering, what, what is, has his stance against the Israelis changed at all? In the, the, what Iranians do, they are actually attacking Israel, insulting Israel, threatening Israel, is a way of gaining popular support in the Arab street. And in that sense, I think Israel is in part responsible for that. What Israel is doing to the millions of pa pa Palestinians are the only population group in the world without national identity, without a passport. What does Israel want to do with these people? I mean, the United States doesn't recognize the legitimacy of settlements on the West Bank. No country in the world does. The only country that... It, so even though Israel is a very democratic country, it's an open society. In my opinion, it's a model for the progressive and democratic because it's the most successful history, the story of nation building in human history. No question about that. I've been to Israel. It's incredible what they have accomplished. And yet, when it comes to treatment of Palestinians, the most interesting criticism comes from Israeli itself, from Israelis themselves, peace movement in Israel. And so long as and this situation continues, all kinds of demagogues, all kinds of racists, all kinds of anti-Semites can use this to uh, propagate against Israel, and it can be effective. So it's well. If I don't think the Iranian rulers they are as corrupt, as dictatorial as any, and yet I don't think they're more suicidal than anyone else. They lock other people to commit suicide for them. <laughs> but they are no more suicidal than Americans or the Israelis or any other people. But it doesn't matter. Still, if, if we want to prevent proliferation, Iran has to be stopped. It's not Israel only. It's the other countries in the region, they say, wow, if Israel has nuclear bomb, Iran has nuclear bomb, Pakistan has nuclear bomb, why not us? It's a source of, pre you join a club. So in the, it is not only the threat to Israel that is 
requires the United States and the European countries to prevent Iran from gaining the capacity to make nuclear weapons. It is the importance of stopping proliferation. Thank you so much.